you to come here and share all the things that we try to sort of <coughs> develop for neuroendocrine tumors and other types of cancers. And sort of, you know, it's, it's something we, you never know what developments and how they play out in life. And so, you know, we try to bring in the best practices from around the world and see um, which, which, which one of those will, uh, you know, will, will sort of stick in neuroendocrine tumors. So, so you know, we, we, we treat, we as a group have treated so many, um, so many, so many, um, uh, so many of these kinds of tumors that, that you know, I just want to, I, I just want to go over that and, and I'm honored that Lisa sort of uh, asked me to come and do this. So let's see if I can do that. So let me just bring up the talk. There we go. So, you know, so what is it that radiologists do? I mean, so, you know, what, what we've done at UCLA is to sort of partner with all of our colleagues to treat a variety of cancers, and neuroendocrine tumor is chief among them. So basically, we as radiologists use our skills on, on the imaging side, because all of the tumors and all the cancers rely basically on imaging. So that's the most important thing. Can we see the tumor? Can we see exactly where it is? Can we see how active it is? Can we grade it? Can we do a lot of things without surgery? Because in the old days, everything, you know, everything and it's still on TV, everything's about surgery. You know, ER, everything, everybody just talk, talks about surgery. But we want to not do surgery. We want to have you live your lives, have us facilitate that. Live your lives in a, uh, as best you can, and us be a partner in that, and not, not alter your lives. And that's my goal, is to minimize the impact in anybody's life, and when we need to, partner with you to treat the tumor. Um, the first, so the first among that is to see the tumor well, understand it well, have all the information ahead of us, and then walk with you as, as it progresses. Because the tumor is going to behave as it's going to behave based on its DNA and its RNA, all of the mutations that occur in it. So for us, it's, we want to try to capture that on the imaging, on the other studies that are out there, and then, and then go beyond that to treat them with the different tools that we have, different hammers for different kinds of nails. So, so I'm a part of the Dumont UCLA Liver Cancer Center, which encompasses all sorts of cancers, primary, primary liver cancers, and then neuroendocrine metastasis. So this is a multidisciplinary team. We can't do it alone. We have to learn from each other. We continue to learn. I'm the first to admit I know very little, and I want to say that because, you know, without an open mind, you just, you know, you start getting arrogant, you start getting set in your ways, I don't really want that. I don't want that I, you know, try to tell myself you don't know everything, try to learn, try to go to meetings, every meeting that I can go, uh, you know, it, it, every, everything that I can read, I try to do that to, to, to sort of see what else can we do. Because that's always what I ask, what can we do better than what we have been doing? And in everything that we do, that's the fundamental question. We're not that good, how can we be better? Um, so liver surgery, of course, is the model uh, but I think there's only 20% of patients that are, that are eligible for surgery in this disease, and a lot of diseases. So neuroendocrine tumors, 20% of patients, maybe 30% are eligible for surgery. Then we look for the liver hepatologists, liver doctors, oncologists, the cancer doctors, us as specialized radiologists. So radiologists are, you know, generally do imaging, they look at x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds and things. And then radiation oncologists treat cancers with radiation. They're two separate specialties. And most, most and there used to be one specialty up, to, up until about 40 years ago, but there are two separate specialties. And then also liver pathologists. And, and finally, the nuclear medicine physicians who give the PRMRT treatment and are partners in that. So we are part of the same, essentially the same department and, and work together. Because at every stage of the disease, we uh, apply different different groups of people and their expertise. So we want to have proven therapies like resection and transplantation, which basically uh, are applicable only to 20 or 30% of patients or less. Then we want to bring in emerging therapies. Where are the therapies that we can use for cancer A into cancer B? Can we do that? Um, the same thing with imaging. Can we use something that works for one cancer 
for another cancer. And that's what we're trying to do, or not even cancer, other things. And then, of course, we want to have a lot of clinical trials and, tr and research in these areas. And partner with the scientists here on campus and around uh, the country and the world on basic research strategies that make sense. So you know neuroendocrine tumors better than me. There are a group of tumors arising from the neuroendocrine cells that are all over the body. And they're usually asymptomatic until uh, they metastasize to the liver. That's not always true, but the majority of them are asymptomatic until they, until they metastasize to the liver. A few pancreatic tumors uh, may produce hormones that can cause symptoms, but the majority of them are asymptomatic. And of course, the majority of patients with neuroendocrine tumors will present with liver metastases. So this is something that's going to happen in this type of disease for most of these kinds of tumors. They're kind of a you know, one neuroendocrine tumor is not the same as the other. It's a basket of tumors, and they all behave differently. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, it's hard, it's, it's good to group them together, but they don't explain the individual behavior. And in general, surgical resection, or surgery in general, in the liver is best for small and localized liver tumors. But again, like I said, over and over again, 20 to 30% of, of patients are eligible for surgery. Now, liver transplantation, it's probably, probably for, for tumors that are localized to the liver that are beyond resection, seems to have the best overall chance at giving a cure. But we don't know what happens afterwards. Like, you know, will the cells metastasize elsewhere, outside the liver? We don't know that. But for now, I think that's considered, if, if, if you can have it, probably the best chance at a, at a complete cure uh, for the disease in as much as in a, in, a certain, in a small group of patients, again, less than 20% of patients. For the rest of everybody else, the 70-80% of patients that we have, our goal is to improve survival, you know, live longer, reduce the tumor burden, keep the disease down as much as possible, have you live your lives as, uh, as easily and as naturally as possible, prevent the disease from moving, and then alleviate the clinical symptoms of, 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 uh, as much as we can. So these are all stages. You know, you find the disease, and if it gets worse, and you try different things till you get the right combination of therapies. Um, the, the funny thing is the annual incidence of neuroendocrine tumors in general has increased sixfold. And this may be due to a variety of reasons, maybe because of increasing imaging. Everybody gets some sort of imaging test, either an ultrasound or a CAT scan or something. People are getting a lot more endoscopies and things like that. So a lot more procedures are being done on the general population. This may account for the fact that the neuroendocrine tumors have increased sixfold. And it's a large disease. Now, I didn't actually realize how large it was. It's second only to colorectal cancer as in, in terms of if you group all these diseases together. But the problem is it tends to get split apart. So when you see it in a split apart fashion, it doesn't seem like a big disease. Just pancreas neuroendocrine tumors aren't as big by themselves as a, whole, as a whole lot of neuroendocrine tumors. Pancreas, small bowel, rectal, appendiceal, and elsewhere. So when you, grow, when you group those together, and you know better than anybody, that this is a big disease. And it grows with age. And there's lots and lots of interesting things about it. When you're under 50, it's much less common. When you're over 65, it seems to be almost 20 times as common uh, in, in this age group which is sort of vital age group. Maybe age 65, you know, that number is from 100 years ago, from, from um, when the Germans were trying to sort of figure out a, uh, a way to pay for Social Security. That was 100 years ago. So 65 these days is like 35 back then. So, you know, I, you know, I, I, so that number still sticks, but it's sort of an antiquated number. Um, the side of neurodegenerative tumors matters. So size matters, age matters. Lots of things matter. Small bowel is, you know, is probably the least favorable site. 90% of those tumors metastasize. 30% of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors metastasize. Uh, small bowel is, accounts for 40% of neuroendocrine tumors and 90% of those metastasize. The pancreas accounts for 30% of neuroendocrine tumors and up to 75% metastasize. But if you had it, the rectum or the, uh, uh, the appendix, a much smaller percentage of those metastasize, if at all. So we have all sorts of tools at our disposal, CT, MRI, ultrasound, PET-CT, PET-MR, um, and all of these tools are being used 
to diagnose and in some now treat neuroendocrine tumors. You know, imaging, this is the first, this is only less than 100 years ago. Um, this is Mrs. Rankin's ring finger. That's the first recorded medical images. And this is, this is you know, what we're able to do today, sort of show the body, in, the individual body, not from a textbook, not from, a, not from anything else, but your body in all its, you know, in all its different forms. We can show that very precisely, and that's the kind of imaging we want. But for liver scans especially, imaging must be meticulous. We have to be very careful because the liver is full of, full of all sorts of things, and we've got to be absolutely sure that what we're seeing is a real neuroendocrine tumor. And then radiologists, us, we must be highly experienced, just like all the doctors caring for neuroendocrine tumors, to avoid misinterpretations and uh, misinterpretations of data and imaging and everything else. So we have to have a really specialized team that understands you, understands the disease, understands what's available out there to help the disease. So, for example, you know, how you do things matter. Not everybody with a fancy camera is Ansel Adams, that's what I always say. You know, that's the way it is. So you can look like that. Sometimes it doesn't always, it's not always bright. It can look like a kind of a bunch of grapes. It can look like that. And then it can look like just any old tumor. So they don't always behave the same way. They don't always behave like this. They can behave, you know, they can behave, uh, uh, they can behave like the, one of these three tumors, or you have to separate them from normal things in the liver. So these are tumors that are in the liver that are not neurodegenerative tumors. These are just normal uh, benign liver tumors. They kind of, to an un untrained eye, kind of look very, kind of like look like a neuroendocrine tumor. It lights up, and then it, it keeps doing that. So this is another very common tumor in the liver that's benign, and we don't want to confuse that for neuroendocrine tumor. So you got to, you have to be very precise in how we how we uh, monitor all these things. Here's another tumor that's not a neuroendocrine tumor. So we got to know what's a neuroendocrine tumor and what's not a neuroendocrine tumor. It's very important. Another tumor that's not a neuroendocrine tumor, it's just a hemangioma, a common tumor in up to 1% of the population. So, and, and so a lot of things don't look like neuroendocrine tumors, adenomas, hyperplasias, a lot of things we see don't, they, they superficially resemble them, but they're not neuroendocrine tumors. So we gotta be really, really precise in how we interpret these things. Now, that's the imaging part of things. So we are very careful in how we use CT, MR, nuclear medicine and ultrasound in, to apply to this thing. But we then use those technologies to then put in needles, in some cases not needles, and catheters, and then treat tumors. Because remember, only 20 and 30 percent of patients can get a surgery or a transplant for a neuroendocrine tumor that's in the liver. The, the other 70 to 80 percent rely on one of our, you know, rely on the next best thing, which is which is what we have to offer. And I think what we have to offer is what I would want personally. And that's my test of any, anything that I do. What I want it personally, is it good enough for me or one of my relatives? You know, would, would, I, would I make them take, undergo it? And a lot, of, you know, a lot of things aren't that way. So for me, everything I do has to have passed that test. Will I do it? And so this is, this is what I look for. Is it non-invasive or minimally invasive? Does, will it mean that you have to be in the hospital for more than a few hours? And if you do, why is that? So it has to be, everything we do to treat the tumor has to be minimally or non-invasive. We can use a variety of approaches. It doesn't restrict us just to one thing. We have a number of hammers in our tool belt and we can use all of them or one of them or some combination of them as and when we need it. And then, what we're trying to do is, is, of course, the same thing. Achieve a surgical result without surgery. And that's what we always want to do. Achieve a surgical result without surgery. Um, and, you know, they may help neuroendocrine tumor patients avoid progression. And also maybe help them to get on the transplant list if they can get a transplant. If, if, the, if the tumor behavior isn't so aggressive. So these are all the things we're trying to do. Surgery, only 20 to 30 percent of patients. This, we're trying to take the other 70 percent and see if we can make them into either surgical patients or act like surgical patients or transplant patients. 
So in our experience, we've treated more than 3,000 tumors, well, I think well over 1,500 patients in the last uh, 15, actually almost 20 years now of doing this kind of thing. So we, we are part of the liver clinic. We go to the tumor board. We get together and talk about it. We triage patients to therapy. And we get the best types of imaging studies appropriate to the patient. CT, MRI, PET CT, PET MRI, whatever it takes. Uh, we get one that's within 30 days of the procedure. We see you in clinic, and we are partners with you. So us, our nurse practitioners, we are there in clinic with you uh, when you're referred to us, when you come to us, and for the duration, every three months from the time you come to whatever happens. We'll, we are there in many cases for years. Some of the patients have been, are, have been in my clinic 15, 16, 17 years. So uh, that's, what, you know, that's our commitment to be that partner. We don't know everything. We make mistakes. You know, we are the first to admit that things we did 15 years ago, we don't do anymore. And that's because we always want to get better. But we are going to be with you, uh, if you if you want that kind of partnership. And we do a lot of the medical clearances, labs, and all these things for you and with you. Um, and and after, after any procedure that we do, we follow you up the next day, in a month, every three months. We, like I personally want to review every single study and not some reports. I want to look at the actual study. If you get it done somewhere else, I want to see how good it is and if I can make it, you know, if, if it's good enough for us. And a lot of times it is. I mean, there are great places out there. But I want to be sure that whatever our UCLA standard is should be the best. And if it's not the best, I want it to be the best. So if it's, you know, Mayo Clinic or this or that, well, whatever it is, if, it's, if that's better, I'm going to ask myself, why is it better? Because I don't want, uh, you know, we want to be second to none in your care. Um, and and that, that, that's our, that's my goal. Like, I want to be, you know, as good as it gets for whatever, whatever we, we are helping you with. And I want to personally review everything. So our nurse practitioner, we, we work with them very closely. But at the end of the day, it's me and my, um, you know, my sort of uh, sense of duty on the line. You know, and I want to be sure that I'm looking at your scan today and every scan back to the last 15 years or every scan that's, that, that, that comes up and talk to whoever it is that you know, does something else. So that's what we do at our, at our clinic in this UCLA group is this kind of commitment and very few other practices are set up this way. So this is our multidisciplinary collaboration to, com to commit to, you know, if not knowing everything, trying to know as much as we can. So the best candidates for what we do with, our, with needles and things like that have typically, you don't have metastases outside of the liver and if you do, then we can see if you can treat those two. A single tumor under six centimeters, multiple tumors under three centimeters, and then we make sure that you know, we can correct any coagulation problems that there are and make sure it's safe to do, just technically safe to do. It's not near bile ducts that are, can be obstructed, near the gallbladder that can be injured, near the pericardium that can be injured, that's the lining of the heart that can be injured, near intestines that can't be pushed away, and the diaphragm, which the, 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 your diaphragm, which you need to breathe, make sure that we are either far away from those structures or make it far away from those structures. So we, we look for those kind of things. So we have multiple treatment options, and you all know about PRRT, but before PRRT, this is what most people undergo. Either regional ablation with a catheter-based therapy, with either embolization or... or um, um, or one of the uh, radioembolic procedures, glass or resin beads, or if you have less disease, uh, then ablation, which is heat or cold um, with radio frequency or microwave using a needle. So we have lots of, lots of those kinds of options, lots of devices out there, all of them rely on needles of various kinds, and these are all, so these are the old ones you know, that, that we started off with 20 years ago, and these are all new technologies that have been developed over the past five to six years that we, that we use. So here's how we typically do it. Put a needle into the, into the liver with ultrasound or CT guidance, 
and then use heat to just destroy the tumor and a margin around the tumor. And this usually takes anywhere from five to ten minutes to do this, depending on the size of the tumor. And what we then do is make sure that we are ablating all around this. So this is the tumor that's destroyed by heat. It gets up to 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit uh, all around. And we treat the we treat the entire we treat a margin around the liver, and then um, and then the only drawback to it is that big blood vessels like this can limit how much we do. So this kind of procedure takes uh, half a day, and patients typically go home the same day. So if you know if you're lucky if you're lucky enough to have a single tumor or a few tumors, this is the right strategy because we can we can we can eradicate it without too many problems. Um, let me see if this works. Um, radio frequency and microwave. Microwave ablation is just much faster than the uh, radio frequency ablation. It just works a lot quicker. And um, sorry, now these videos is working in the system. I'm not sure what's happening. Let me see. This is that video that I wanted to play. So let's see, it's, it's a little... So basically, we're just, we're just um, you know, you have the liver here, you have, we go using CT and ultrasound, find the tumor, put it in, and and then five, in five or 10 minutes, this is what you see. That's, that's, that's what, um, that's what you want, ideal result that we just pull out. And there's not even an incision or anything here. There's no incision on the skin, almost nothing, and to know that you were there. The only thing you leave with is a band-aid out here. And that's, that's, that's what we want to do uh, as we do this sort of technology. Uh, let's see. So. so the difference between microwave and radio frequency is that microwave is a technology that allows us to treat much faster and with much bigger, much hotter. Uh, this is this is the actual heat treating this liver uh, compared to radio frequency. So it's just boiling this b boiling this uh, this liver, cooking this liver. Out here, it's 60 degrees Celsius. In here, it's like 212. Uh, two, uh, it's, it's 100 degrees Celsius right there. So this kills cancer instantaneously when it's 60 degrees Celsius, and that's what we want to get. So in the same amount of time, it's roughly double the volume. So it's allowed us to do much bigger tumors than radiofrequency ablation. So this is the kind of ablative uh, development that we want to, to help patients achieve this much quicker. Um, let's see. We could use other things. We could use cryoablation. This creates ice instantaneously. Um, and we sometimes do use that. We use it a lot for tumors that are outside of the liver, sometimes for tumors in the liver. But literally creates these ice, this ice, and the ice destroys cancer as well. So we can use heat, we can use cold. And again, this stays in the liver, but it slowly dissolves over time. And you wouldn't know the difference because you'd have maybe three small little pinpricks here as, uh, as these needles go into the liver. So we can use that. Um, uh, the other technologies we can use We can now use, this is regular ultrasound, which most places have, but for the past five years, we've been using contrast ultrasound. 
So contrast ultrasound is much better to detect neuroendocrine tumors like this than it, that take up, the, take up this dye very, very fast. And the best thing about this contrast that you get, this dye, is that you just breathe it out. You just breathe, breathe it out and it's, it has no toxicity, almost no toxicity, toxicity we know of to the kidneys and other things. And there's no x-rays, there's none of that stuff, there's no radiation. And so this is what we, we want to do. This is not out there, even though it's commercially available by the, for the last two years, most centers aren't doing it. So you want to find a place that has these kinds of technologies to do it. Because you can see that tumor before we ablated it. And then, <coughs> after we ablate it, we put a needle into it, heat it, and the same tumor now is dark. You can see how dark it is. It's not taking up the dye, and you can see a nice margin around it. That's what you want to do. Just go in there very precisely and put a needle in it, treat it, and get out of there. And then, and then, and then keep following it up. And hopefully, there's no downtime. I mean, one, you know, some people have gone back to work the next day. You know, some people uh, are back on their feet the same night. So this is what I, this is the kind of thing we want. And to do it and to see it real precisely without any other side effects and toxicities, and that's that's what we that's what that's what that's what we always want to do. So let me go back to the talk. So this is uh, electroporation. Some people have asked about this. This is another technology that uses two needles, also two needles, and um, it. It uses basically, let's see if I can make this. Let's see if we're back there. Uh, and that uses, it doesn't use heat or cold, it uses high voltage electricity to kill the tumors in a in a in in a, in a specific way. So for example, When we do it, this is these are the needles. I, I don't know if you can see it all that well. Uh, it doesn't seem to be playing. That's weird. It's playing on my screen, but not on there. I'm just going to end that for a second. There. Let me go back here. I'm going to play some of these things that for some reason it won't play or it won't project. <laughs> okay. So this is this is how electroporation works. These are the two, th those are the two needles. And as you get these high voltage DC currents, they, they just, they're giving off these voltages simultaneously. And whatever's here, all the tissue in here, um, the cell wall breaks down and, uh, and basically uh, the, the tumor gets destroyed. And so that's, that's electroporation. It's, a, it's another technology and, um, and, and um, you know, very effective, but not necessarily more effective than anything else. And when we do electroporation, the good thing is the tissue that's dead is dead. And there's a very precise margin between what's dead and what's alive. So that's good. When you do heat or cold, there's always a transition point here. And, and so this is a little bit better than that because there's no transition. There's no, there's no zone here that has live and dead cells. So this works really nicely. It's a little cumbersome, but it works pretty nicely. But again, we don't use it all that much because we don't need to. We, we just find ways around it. Uh, 
because it's much quicker to use the, uh, the, the heat or cold with microwave or cryoablation. And you can see this is what a liver looks like, and you get a very precise zone of ablation. Um, Hemoembolization is a technique where we put a, meat, put a catheter in the groin, go up the aorta, find the artery to the liver, and, and then deliver chemotherapy and uh, beads that block up these blood vessels. Because we know that most neuroendocrine tumors get all of their, all of the blood supply comes from the artery and not the vein. So when it comes from the artery, we can plug up the arteries here and cause the, the tumor to starve. And it starves it of blood supply, oxygen that it needs, and kills it that way. So there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of different little ways to put beads in there to, to basically plug up these vessels. You're plugging it up and killing the tumor. And, um, and what you see is a big tumor like this. Um, you just use, you, there's a catheter in here. Catheter that goes, you put it in, into the hepatic artery, and when you, when you give the dye, you'll see all of this tumor, and you want to individually kill all these little vessels that are in there. And as you do that, you'll kill the tumor. And it's a very effective, uh, very effective strategy for some kinds of tumors, as, and radio, uh, especially neuroendocrine tumors. And at the end of it, you'll see that when the tumor is well treated, the whole thing turns kind of white like this. And so that is hepatic chemoembolization. And that's a very effective technique for more advanced, uh, more advanced level of tumor compared to the uh, compared to ablation. So bigger tumors, more tumors, tumors that are on both sides. Um, and uh, basically, you can you know you can you can do this in different you know some places aren't great to ablate, especially when they're centrally in the liver. But when we use chemoembolization, you can treat just about anywhere as long as you can see the tumor and you can see the fact that it takes up all of the blood supply from the arteries. So it's a very effective tool, although I think, I think for me it's a secondary tool to ablation because um, ablation is just a lot simpler with less radiation and it kills instantaneously. This takes a little while to kill. The next, the next hammer that we have is radioembolization with Y90. So this is a beta emitting radioactive source, and we have small spheres that are impregnated with this Y90 um, through a small, uh, a small incision in the groin. We have two different kinds, therosphere and sersphere, and they're both used off-label for neuroendocrine tumors. They're not specifically approved for neuroendocrine tumors, but one is approved for liver cancer, primary liver cancer, and the other one's approved for metastatic colon cancer. And they have different levels of radiation, but they pretty much do the same thing. So they have small beads. These are 25 micron beads. You put a little catheter into the groin, and you put it up the aorta into the liver, and you'll see the blood, the, the, you know, the blood, here's red blood cells in this sort of simulated diagram going through the artery. But you put the catheter in here, and you spur, and you, you, you gotta precisely find where you're going, and then spray the beads into the arteries. And what it does is ends up in the arteries, it's in the, in, at, the, at, the, at the small arteries in the tumor, and starts emitting all this radioactivity. It starts emitting radioactivity, and when you have multiple tumors like that, the idea is these beads are kind of plugged up in the tumor, emitting the radioactivity, and what you hope is it just shrinks the tumor over time. And that's what Y90 radioembolization does. So take something like this, these tumors like, tumors like this, and then turns them into sort of scar-like things that you see on the CT scans. We can use ethanol sometimes for liver cancers. We can't really use it for, for, um, for neuroendocrine tumors, but we can use all of these other things for neuroendocrine tumors. So we can use lots of different ways to, to guide ablation, ultrasound, CT, ultrasound and CT, which we do, and then MRI. And then we just go right through the skin. We can use that surgically, but we prefer not to go surgically if we can avoid it. 
And then we can also do it while a patient is getting surgery. We can go in there and clean up the other tumors with these kinds of techniques. So this is a way we combine multiple modalities to help patients maximally. So radiofrequency ablation is a current-based technique with different sorts of devices. A current goes into your body. Microwave ablation is just like a microwave that you have at home. It is a wave-based technique where the waves emit, and both of them do the same thing. They, they stir up the water molecules and heat them. And so this is, these are some microwave devices. And basically on ultrasound, you put you put the you put the uh, you put the needle into the tumor, and as it heats up, it becomes brighter and brighter till it covers the entire area. And then you'll see it being dark on CT afterwards. And this is how it looks. Uh, I showed you that rim with the electroporation, where we have a very precise zone in ablation. You have that that sort of you have the that the red, the pink rim is the is the dead tissue right in the middle. That sort of halo around it, which is here and here, is um, dead and live tissue. That's where we can run into problems. So we strive to minimize that, and we do all that. And, you know, tr try to create this big, huge ablation the way we do it. We often end up with things like this, or this is because of the blood supply, but we try as much as possible to get these big, big tumors treated that way. The next thing we're trying to do is using, to use the power of the immune system. So that's ablation. Now we're trying to use the power of the immune system to treat tumors like this, which are very advanced. Um, this lady's been, you know, having, dealing with this very advanced liver cancer for 15 years. What we're trying to do is put a needle in there, put some, put some uh, genetically modified virus in there to stimulate the immune system, to kill the, to kill the, to kill all, all of these tumors and tumors everywhere in the body. And that's a new strategy called immunomodulation. And so that's not heat or cold. It can be used with both, but it's for advanced disease. And that's the next generation, immunomodulation. It's used really nicely in melanoma to create really nice results, and we can try and see if we're gonna, if we can turn that into neurodegenerative tumors and other cancers that are advanced. Use your own, the power of your own body to just kill the cancer, because that's what you do every day. Every day, from the moment we were born or conceived, we've been fighting off cancers. You know, we've been fighting off cancers, we've been fighting off infections, we do that successfully. You know, it's when the cancer gets an upper hand, that's when we have trouble, and we're trying to rev up the immune system to do that. So this is, this is how ablation looks. So if that's the tumor, if that's the tumor here, we're trying to, to, try to treat it and get a margin around it. That's what it looks like after ablation. And that's what it looks like just dead here. This tumor is dead and uh, the heat is just all around it. So here are some other examples of these neuroendocrine tumors that are, that are here and then you get a bigger zone of ablation. So sometimes when you don't have experienced people, they'll say the tumor grew. But you have to tell them if you ever had an ablation or some other sort of some other sort of therapy. No, no, that's not the that's not the tumor growing. This is what we want to see. This is the the zone that we see around the tumor to make sure it's dead and the margin around it is bigger and dead as well. And that's what you want to see over time. The tumors shrink after they die. They shrink back. They shrink back to what we what we expect, and that's how we want to see you over time when the tumors shrink. And the same thing with chemoembolization. That the tumor is there. We, we do we go in and put in the put in the beads, and then the tumor just acts like the same thing. It's just there's no it doesn't take up the dye, and it shrinks over time. That's what we want to see. Tumors like this are difficult when they have multifocal sort of disease, whether it's liver cancer or NET, it's the same thing. We have to be very careful about these kinds of tumors. They don't do that well necessarily with these particular devices and technologies, and that's where PRRT comes into play. And lymph node metastases, we know that there's tumor in the liver, there's also tumor here in the lymph node, and this, this is where PRRT would, would come in. So here's an example. Um, 
you know, of, 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 one of, of one of our patients here that, that I've treated and continue to follow in January 2015, had all of these liver metastases, patient underwent surgery, take out those tumors, and then ablate a bunch of other small ones. In December 2015, so that was, we had a recurrence here on this dotatate PET. And so we saw that here on, on uh, MRI. And you know, notice that it's very close to the bowel here. So we have to be very careful. On ultrasound, we see this. The bowel's right here. We put a little fluid in there to separate the bowel. And then put a needle, and put another needle, and a tumor, and treat a margin around it. Um, and then uh, there was another tumor that we also saw, so we treated that as well uh, in January 2016. We used contrast ultrasound, and we treated that as well uh, at, a different, at a different time. So both of those were, were uh, treated. Then, unfortunately, April 2016, MRI showed multiple new other tumors, and that dotatate PET confirmed it. So, and there were tumors in the liver and tumors outside of the liver. Um, and these are all these tumors in the liver, and there are also tumors in the spine and elsewhere. So that was a kind of discouraging result, but luckily, the patient underwent PRRT for sessions of PRRT back then in 2016, in 20, uh, uh, 16, 2016. And now, you know, miraculously, it's free of all tumor. So this is what can happen. It doesn't, it's not what always happens. It's not what even usually happens. But this is the kind of thing, surgery, ablation, imaging carefully, follow-up every three months, all of that is important. And a team of doctors who, you know, sort of talk together and I think generally try to think outside the box as much as possible to do it, to treat these very difficult tumors. It's a difficult tumor to treat. It's not easy. It's wily. It's, you know, it, as you can see, it's like you thought you had it cornered, but no, it escaped. And so, again, but this is going to continue to be followed. So results... You know, and when you look at just the numbers, it's kind of discouraging. If you have the mean survival for all sites, it's about 10 years, which is, compared to most cancers, actually pretty good, but you want better than that. Um, if you only had a localized neuroendocrine tumor, the average median survival is 30 years. If you had metastases to one area, it's 10 years, and if you have distant metastases all over the body, it's 12 months. Those are the numbers, and so it's not easy to hear those numbers as a doctor and as a patient. But to me, I never quote statistics to patients because you never know what's going to happen to you. And I never know, you know, none of these people had our team. And none of these people had the follow-up. They didn't have all these, they didn't have all the resources that we are bringing to this disease. So this is maybe what's possible. We always want to make it better than what this is. The grade of the tumor matters. So if it's grade one, that's generally the best outcomes. If it's grade three and four, it's generally the worst outcome. So you can see grade one goes to 16 years, whereas grade three and four goes to 10 months. So you already know that, the grade matters. So again, we don't let this influence too much what we do, but we have to be realistic and say, well, you know, 16 years, that's, that's a long time. Well, who could predict 16 years uh, ago our political situation would be as it is? And, uh, uh, and now look, you're in 10 months, 10 months is, uh, you know, we, we're going to try and make that 20 months and 30 months if we can. Um, therapeutic strategies. You look at numbers like this and graphs like this, I really don't like them because, you know, they're on the internet, but they're not, they, they don't tell the whole truth. So, for example, it says that when you do a resection, it has the best outcome. But it doesn't tell you that only 20% of people are eligible for that. It tells you when you have... Um, a, less, a, a complete resection is good, a not so complete resection, not so good. Transplantation is pretty good, but has a really wide range. And it doesn't tell you that uh, only 20% of people are eligible. But these are all the other two, other sorts of treatments. Chemo, PRRT, S SIRT, and then TACE. But what this doesn't tell you is, this is a lot of people here in this group who are being helped by all these things because without them, 
they would face even worse odds. So these group of patients are much more advanced than these group of patients. And so you can't compare apples and oranges. You know, you can't compare apples and oranges. And so you gotta be really careful when you really read things online or what people are telling you because, you know, you can be fooled and I can be fooled just by looking at that wondering, wow, why, didn't I, why doesn't everybody just get liver surgery? Well, they can't. We're trying to do that, take ablation and make that into kind of a liver surgery. Or the combination of all these things. So only 20 to 30 percent of patients are eligible for liver for liver surgery. But if you are eligible, you do pretty well. You do really well. I mean, up to 50 percent of patients are, are still alive 10 years later with a liver metastasis from a neuroendocrine tumor if it's localized and you can operate on it. Liver transplantation in both Europe and the United States is pretty good, but again, it's limited to a certain group of patients. But again, 50% of patients are alive at five years after liver transplantation, but it's not easy to do this, and not easy to undergo this. In the US, especially at UCLA, uh, if you get this, you probably get a multivisceral transplantation, kind of a foregut transplantation, the liver, the pancreas, and part of the intestines. Chemoembolization, again, these are this group of patients is, has much more disease, and the, the, it varies. One year, people do pretty well. In five years, uh, the best case scenario, if you have limited volume disease, is that 50% of patients are alive in five years if you just have this strategy at some centers. Radioembolization has, 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 has um, a pretty good, pretty good uh, six track record. There have been 11 studies and seven abstracts. 19% of people who've had radioembolization had something else that, and didn't do as well on that. But again, at three years, 45% of patients are still alive. And it, uh, it depends on what kind of tumor you had. If you have carcinoid, you do pretty well. If you have unclassified tumors, you don't do as well. And the grade matters, grade three, Patients with grade three tumors don't do as well. Whereas grade one always does much better. So, you know, you are dealt, but we're all dealt certain, we're all dealt some certain cards, and if you get the right ones, you do better. That's always true, but I think we are helping to, to move that to out as far as possible. And to me, that's the most rewarding thing about this, is that we can try and at least push the envelope on what uh, nature is already sort of predetermined, predetermined in many cases. And of course, PRRT, um, uh, again, it's not for everybody, grade one or two, and patients have to have expression of, soma, expression of somatostatin receptors. So it's not like everybody can get this, but if you can get it, then you can get pretty good, pretty good results. I mean, not everybody can get a total response. A complete response is seen in less than 2% of patients. A partial response is seen about a third of patients. And you can get out to several, you know, several years with this sort of treatment. So I think it's very exciting, but again, not limited, not for everybody. It's a, it's a certain group of patients who can benefit from this. But another really exciting hammer that we have in our tool belt. So this is a little bit of a snapshot, I'm sorry about the videos, of of what we do. So we are, we see ourselves as a partner in undergoing this sort of journey. Everybody's journey is different. Um, and you know, we just, we, we want to just help you sort of navigate what's out there, help us ourselves understand what's out there, and either do it ourselves or find people who will do it. So thank you. I have a few questions that's um, come up on Slido already. Thank you, Dr. Raymond, for a very thorough talk. Um, and thank you for explaining all the different hammers for the nails. We, want, we all want many, as many hammers as possible to kill those cells. <laughs> so, yeah, so I guess a, big, a basic question for us as patients and on this side of things, since we're not radiologists and we're not the ones that determine it, how do we know that these uh, the images we're getting are these best images. How do we find the radiologists and the team and the centers that can know nets and be able to care for this? Well, I would say that um, you know I think this is where nets nets itself can come in. 
I think some other disease groups partner with institutions to have a, a database of sites that they uh, refer in their community. So I think that's something that Nets, could, Nets itself could do as an organization. Not necessarily say that, hey, you know, I think identify teams such as ourselves around the country, around the state, in the cities, to say these people have, you know, expressed interest in working with Nets patients, in Nets itself, Net tumors themselves, and create a database. I think that's something that can this org organization like this can do, and then um, and you know that can that can that can blossom into something that can they can uh, invite these people to meetings and, and, and have a group of pa a group of people who are dedicating part of their careers to, or some of all of their careers to this disease. So I think I can't tell you how you as an individual can do it, but I would say that you want to find people and places that have the infrastructure. Because it's not something you treat at your local doctor, it's just not. It's not that kind of disease. It, you know, it's just too much, too complicated, even for us, to deal with. So you have to find places that have this infrastructure that can cope with it. So um, another question, thank you for mentioning that whole zone of ablation, that dead tissue that happens, and I think that that's actually a really good point, <laughs> because as we've found, in our um, images, um, a lot of people don't know how to read that tissue, and it looks like tumor. So can you speak on that a little bit, how we know that these are being read right, or how this can be approached? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same answer. So where you go for, so you think of, you have a very special disease, and everybody who deals with it has to be special. I would think of it like that. That's how I think of it. You know, will I want, you know, some a general look. I mean, most of the doctors out there are good people. They're good general doctors. But once you get into this kind of thing, this is like the weeds, and you're, you know, you have no idea what's in there. So I would say that everybody who deals with your care in every facet of it should know something about if be subspecialized in that area. And so if they're not, then you ask yourself, well, why am I going here? So you take control of all that. I want to go to Center X that has, you, you know, you're educating yourselves. That's what, that's the great thing about this thing, this whole organization and organizations like this. You're educating yourselves, you're educating each other. So as you do that with these meetings and everything you have, all the resources you have, you want to develop an ecosystem where people who are known um, are there around the country. So you want to know the right pathologists, the right radiologists, the right interventional radiologists, the right nuclear medicine physicians. And they're, luckily or unluckily, there are not that many of them in the country. You know, so that's, I guess, unlucky for some and lucky for others. So it's not like it's a huge list of people. There are only few. So I think if we can work together to bring each other up to speed, uh, then I think that'll be the best thing. Like, you know, have a patient, they access the resources, say, here are the doctors in my area or close to me, here are the, here are all of them, and this is where I want to have my care, or I get a second opinion from these people about my care. Okay, I can't go there, but at least I can send my stuff there and they can check. Okay. And um, I guess along those lines, with all these hammers in the toolbox, um, how do we know at what point when to go for which? And now with PRT that's out, how does the sequencing work, or how's that decided? And also, can it be used for tumors outside of the liver? Yes. So, uh, how do we know? Well, to me, it's the, it's, like, it's, the, it's the order of my talk. If you can get surgery, get surgery. That's number one, because that is tried and true. If you can't get surgery, ablation is next. Because that's simple, it's like surgery, it achieves similar outcomes, um, and you can do it over and over again, and it's outpatient procedure. If that doesn't work, your disease is more advanced, think about the regional approaches like TACE or Y90, those things. And then for those, you have to go to people who are experienced in those, both ablation and that. So that's one step up. It's, you know, TACE and Y90 is more disease, but it's all in the liver, all in the liver. 
Ablation can be used outside the liver too, depending on where it is. It can be used in the lung, it can be used in the bone, it can be used in soft tissue, it can be used all over. We are ablating things everywhere. Um, the heat, the cold, um, the, um, we're using, I didn't even talk about ultrasound, we're using ultrasound to treat tumors, not just to image them. So we, you know, ablation, then surgery if possible, then ablation, then embolization. And PRRT is for, is for exactly widespread disease either in the liver or uh, outside the liver. And that's where you want, you don't want to start with PRRT, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. You don't want to, you know, because it's, it is, it does have toxicity. It's not like it, it doesn't have, it has side effects. It can have radiation tissues and things like that. So that's the biggest hammer we have. And that's when the disease gets to a point where, you know, first of all, you have to have the right kind of tumor. You have to have a somatostatin expressing tumor. You have to have grade one or two. Whereas for ablation and embolization and all those things, even when they're not that, we can try and use it to help people. Knowing that it won't work as well, but it'll probably work to some degree. So I think PRRT is, a to me, almost like a last resort. You've done all these things, and then you go to PRRT. And I guess one, one last question. How, can you speak a little bit to the patient's experience, especially after ablation, and what they might feel and go through, like the fevers and the pain? So, so um, ablation is totally variable. Um, if you ablate a lot of tissue, the dead tissue it can cause uh, temporarily a lot of reaction from the body. So in that situation, you can have low-grade fevers, you can't have pain, you can't just feel like flu-like symptoms. That's what typically occurs, and you can even speak to that if you want. You want, you want to speak to that? Um, yeah, I, I, I In the mic. Yeah, come on up. Yeah, it's kind of funny because actually when I, I had RFA uh, from Dr. Raymond actually, um, actually, afterward, immediately afterward, I felt fine. And I think the, the next day we went to a Christmas party and I was like, oh, I feel fine. And we walked out of the party and about, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and suddenly I just went, oh crap, I feel awful. <laughs> and then I went home and it was like I had the flu, I, I had a fever and I just laid in bed for like maybe a day or two days. But it was like, this is exactly what I can remember. How about the second time around? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't as bad. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's the kind of, you know, you, I, I think most people have that, and the, and the pain can last up to a week, but we can, it's nothing, most of the pain, most of the time the pain is controlled if it's there. It's controlled with pain medications that we give you. Um, and you, you write it out, and like I said, a lot of people are at work, could be at work the next day, but some people take a few days off. So it's not so bad. The embolization and the Y90 is a little more involved. Embolization can have more pain. But still nothing, you know, you don't, you're pretty much on your feet in, within a week, or if, if not earlier, depending on how, you, how, 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 it, how you're affected. So, you know. Yeah. I remember one thing you told us was, it depends how much tumor, how many, tumors, how large they are, it's yeah. how many cells are dying, right? So unfortunately he got a page from us at midnight when his fever <laughs> reached like 101.5, but Dr. Raymond was kind enough to call us back and say it's gonna be okay. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, I mean, every time we do it, it's sort of a slightly new experience, everybody's different, but that's in general what you, what you want. Just, just keep doing it and minimize the amount of impact to each individual p person. <laughs> okay, that's great. Right, and again, the key test for me is would I want it? And I would say yes, because that satisfies all those things. Any, any questions from the audience? Um, so just, just a reminder that um, if it's a more personal question, we're going to turn the cameras off, but if it's more general, then we can keep asking. Just a reminder. And if we could repeat the question in the mic. Sure. Thank you. Okay, yes. I have a general question. Yes. Um, it says that the um, median uh, PFS for PRT therapy might be somewhere in the 36 or maximum 40 months range. Uh, 
what about consideration of another round of P uh, PRT after that time? We didn't talk about Could that. Could you repeat the question? Please? Yeah, so the, the question was, it was said that the me uh, uh, median survival after PRT was 36 to 40 months. What about another round? And I'm not sure about that because when you do PRRT, it's four cycles every, up to four cycles, uh, or four cycles every uh, nine, eight to nine weeks apart. So I'm not sure if we can do it yet. You know, I'm not sure if we can do that again and repeat that. It's possible, I guess, but maybe Lisa knows. Um, well, everything's kind of pending right now, right, with insurance and other issues. So. I know Excel Diagnostics, if you're stable for six months or more, they'll do two more rounds. Um, in Europe, they have their own protocols. So it all depends where you're getting it. There's not necessarily a limit to how many they're doing, but it's all individually based and also depending on your numbers and your blood counts and everything. Yeah, because if three years go by and you're stable, oh, but then oh. it starts progressing again, why not have another four sessions of PRRT? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, of course, technically, it's possible. I just don't know. You know, you can only have a certain dose of radiation. That's the thing. You know, and before things... So I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that part of it. It's a good, good, good question on, that, on the May 19th. Can you ask what that question is? Oh, what about repeating P, uh, uh, PRRT again uh, after, the, after uh, you said a few years? Well, if, if, if you have a PFS <laughs> progression-free survival after three years, say, yeah. And then it starts to progress slowly. Yeah. Why not go in for another four sessions? Yes. Why not go in for another session right. after four years if it progresses? And I think technically it's po definitely possible. Theoretically, I'm not sure what, if there's a radiation limit. Okay. Um, one last question, and I thank you for your time. He has a full clip. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, in uh, getting, uh, for example, uh, I've had some scans done, and if I wanted to do a referral for a second opinion, how would, okay, so the question is, if someone wanted to come see Dr. Raymond and the UCLA um, radiology um, experts in this area, how would they come about, go about doing that? Uh, well, Lisa's the expert there, so she can answer. She can, she, can, uh, she can tell you how to do that. You just come to her clinic or, you know, uh, you, can, you can send, send, send the information to our clinic. Yeah, and, yeah, and Lisa knows how to get the hold of us. Okay. And, uh, and you know, we have, I didn't bring any of my cards or anything, no, but. You offer a second opinion. Oh, of course, yeah. Of course. It's, you know, find me through UCLA. Yes. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there was another question that came in, and if. I lost the question already. Uh, where'd it go? Can you repeat the question, Fred? Uh, can you contrast the advantages of, uh, for outside of the liver, microwave? versus cryo um, besides the speed uh, and whether one acts as an immunomodulator uh, on its own or not. Yeah, they're, they're, and so the question is, can you comment about cryo versus microwave for tumors outside the liver to see if one is more immuno, immunomodulatory? And there is theoretically more immunomodulation with cryo. It's, it's more, it, it tends to, tends to rev up the immune system more, but whether that translates into a real practical outcome is open for debate. Nobody's really shown that it does. People have shown that it affects a level of different immune agents, cytokines, etc. But does that mean better cancer treatment? That's hard to know. In general, if it's soft tissue or somewhere sensitive, we try to use cryo. It's near the skin. We try not to use microwave in most areas outside the liver, except in the lung. But um, but they can, be both, they can both be used. Again, it's more of the, about the comfort of the practitioner rather than the device. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Raymond, for all your time. And I know he has a full clinic, so thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's very exciting, exciting to uh, see the level of engagement in this, in this, uh, in this organization. <laughs>